Pulling up both slides. Yeah, I'm from Colorado School of Mines. I am a civil engineer, specifically a geotechnical engineer. Um, my host is the University of Chile, specifically the Faculty of uh, Physical Sciences and Mathematics. I'm in the Buchep campus, uh, not very far from uh, Park O'Higgins. Um, my um, host is uh, Dr. Felipe Agustin Ochoa. He's a young and upcoming professor, also civil engineering, did his PhD in Purdue. I'm also being helped by my classmate, my PhD classmate, who owns one of the biggest uh, uh, consulting companies in GHAS and in Chile. So he's a pretty wealthy guy, so I'm taken care of. Okay, uh, I hope to take a short trip to Asuncion, Paraguay in October for the Latin American Rocks, Rock Mechanics Symposium. Okay, uh, what's the motivation for our project? Well, we all know about climate change, we're all worried about it. Um, but Chile is specifically special because Chile has uh, nine uh, climatic types, nine zones. So it class classified according to the Koppen system. You, of course, have the subarctic, the tundra in the south, ice caps, and you have the hot desert in the north, and everything in between. At the same time, Chile is a country that's been very susceptible to a lot of geologic hazards, particularly earthquakes. The biggest uh, earthquake recorded, recorded huh, in human history happened in Valdivia in 1960, magnitude 9.5, about wow. 9.5. And, and that is super destructive. You know, the, the destructive power of earthquakes tend to the, to the magnitude. So 10 to the 7, the big difference between 10 to the 9.5. Um, that was very hard, but there's been other earthquakes too. A recent one is, I think, in 2010 when there was tsunami. So earthquakes, they have volcanoes, they have landslides, which is particularly my area, debris flow, and of course, whenever you have earthquakes, you also have tsunamis. Uh, it's very susceptible geohazard because it sits in the so-called Pacific Rim of Fire. So it's there. Um, it's mounted as uh, topography, diverse climatic conditions, and very long lo uh, coastline. Um, okay, so there is an interaction between climate and, and geohazards. Some, some geo climatic changes are going to have profound effect on some of the of the geohazard. It doesn't affect earthquakes. Maybe it, there may be some effect if some of the ice in the south melts, so that reduces the load somehow, but that's pretty remote. Uh, but mostly it's, uh, it's uh, uh, rainfall, drought, uh, melting of ice, melting of snow. This uh, changes the topography of, uh, of uh, affected areas. So it is expected that Chile is going to uh, suffer maybe about 1.5 degrees centigrade by mid-century and about 3 degrees by the end of the century. That's a lot. And it's already being felt. There is a region called Laguna de Aculeo, which is very popular with Chile Chileans. It's a very popular place to go on vacation. There used to be a lake there. And if you had a summer house there, that value of that summer house is, is just scan now because it's no longer waterfront. It's completely dry. Okay. Another effect that you see a lot is, of course, forest fires. We see this a lot in the U.S. and Chile is not different. Um, how is forest, forest fire affecting uh, landslide? Well, the ashes behave very differently from the soil. So, yeah, and some of them uh, have a negative effect on the stability of slides, the ashes. So, uh, subsidence will be one when the grow groundwater goes down. Uh, not a big issue except in the coastal areas. And of course, uh, uh, effects of snow and ice also. The amount of snow you have in the mountains, in the Andes, that could affect the stability of some of the slopes there. So there are many, many interactions. There are many things that get worse because of climate change. So it's important to, to, to understand those. So my goal is to see, see some of the areas that are 
affected by climate change, already being affected, and what could what the climate change will do with the, the geohazard potentials. Um, really, it's just to start the collaboration with the University of Chile. Uh, I don't think I can accomplish much in three months to relay some of my <coughs> knowledge that I have in this area. So, to give you a background, my most recent experience is in the Arctic Circle in Svalbard, in the high north. Um, we had a project there with the new Norwegians, uh, partly funded by the Norwegians Research Council and the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, the poles, the North Pole particularly, is now undergoing the most rapid temperature change. So if you want to see an acceleration of the effect of climate change, go to the, north, the high latitudes and you can see how, how important it is. So the idea here was that uh, this Balbard uses coal to power its, its uh, community. There's only about 4,500 people living in Svalbard, but still they need electricity. That electricity is generated by coal. There used to be a used coal mining community in, 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 in Svalbard. By the way, Svalbard is a multinationally controlled island, okay, serious islands. It's a, there is a treaty. Several countries have a right to explore this. You have Chinese there, and there's a lot of Russians. There are two villages there, uh, Barentsburg and Pyramiden. Uh, Pyramiden is completely abandoned. By the way, if you're looking for a trip of a lifetime, go there. You can see everything. The northernmost uh, uh, stage of Linen, the northernmost Balalaika, the northernmost uh, swimming pool, the northernmost piano, you find it there. Anyway. Those are uh, coal mining communities. The only remaining coal mining community there is also Russian, but runs, run by Ukrainians, um, <laughs> is in Barentsburg, very, very remote. So coal. Now, what they want to do is to make a system in the North uh, Arctic, whereby they will capture the coal from the, from the uh, electric plants, power plants, and try to put it back into, into the ground. So we did a lot of geological survey to try to co capture it and inject it back to the ground. Now you have to put it in a place that's going to stay for long. And I found that one of the good areas was um, permafrost. We did hide it under permafrost, but the irony is that the permafrost is also going to disappear. So anyway, so this is uh, part of the trip that we did. We organized students. And we brought them to several places. We have to wear polar suits. And you wonder why the students are yeah. learning how to shoot polar bears. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. oh. and, and fortunately, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to get a rifles because the polar bears. The polar bears are getting angrier and hungrier. Mm -hmm. They live on ice flows, <laughs> right, so. and the ice flows have disappeared. And they have become cannibalistic, oh. mm. start everything, and they will eat everything, including humans. So fortunately, the south, we only have penguins. So <laughs> I look forward to visiting the south as well. Let's see. When you say the cannibalistic, people? you mean they're eating each other? They're yeah. eating each other. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So mm -hmm. eating each other. So, so anyway, yeah, they, they are the most susceptible animals like now uh, back to climate change. Um, so I want to go to the south and see what's the difference between the north and the south and the fall, and then I will have a covered both ends of the world. Mm -hmm. 